Welcome, everybody, at uh, the Cultural and Consciousness and Activity of Human Brains Fondazione Prada. We are here for the fourth discussion, and we have the privilege to have with us tonight Catherine Amunds. Catherine, welcome here for this uh, event. I think it's a great pleasure to have Catherine with us. You will allow me just to say a few words about you. Uh, Catherine is, uh, is a wonderful neuroscientist. Uh, he's professor of brain research and director of the Sicilian Oscar Vogt Institute of Brain Research in Dusseldorf at the Heinrich Hain University. Uh, she's also director of the Institute of Neuroscience and Medicine Research Center Julich since 2016 and is the scientific research director of the European Human Brain Project. You will hear something about it. She is well known for her fundamental work in, the, in, in created the cytoarchitectonic atlas, Julek Brain Atlas, which is one of the most used uh, uh, type of atlas in neuroscience. They provide a multi-scale brain data into a common reference uh, brain and use methods of high performance computing to generate ultra high resolution human brain models. She is a member of the German Ethics Council from 2012 till uh, 2020, and in the last three years is co-speaker uh, of the Graduate School Max Planck School of Cognition, Leipzig in Germany. And more recently, she is also a member of the International Advisory Council Healthy Brains for Healthy Lives at the McGill University. Catherine, it's up to you now to moderate this very important discussion. Thank you very much uh, for this kind introduction and indeed this is my pleasure and uh, I feel particularly honored to moderate this discussion uh, of this week, which is dealing with the evolution of culture and how far will we go. And it is really exciting because uh, this topic goes far beyond uh, neuroscience and I'm very pleased to see um, our two experts here. Uh, that will cover the, the different fields that we will address. And please allow me at this point uh, to give a very short introduction that puts these two talks under one umbrella. And I think uh, we, we cannot speak about culture without speaking about arts and, and symbolic forms. And when we have a look to this painting by, uh, by Michelangelo, then most people independently from which culture they are coming from, they would agree that there is a exciting beauty of this image and that they understand uh, the, the gestures and that they get a feeling uh, about the message uh, that is being sent. And um, that, that's, that's really interesting. And that um, was the basis that some of our colleagues formulated uh, the concept of symbolic forms uh, that seem to be so universally and uh, so general. But some of my colleagues, of brain researchers at least, or, at phys or some physicians, they would see in this image uh, not only uh, a part uh, of the creation, but they would also see in the right hand uh, side, in the right part of the image, uh, something that looks like a brain. And uh, speculations and hypotheses came up that Buonarroti, who was uh, indeed one of the first who was studying the brain and the human body in very much detail, has uh, drawn this particular shape uh, because he was thinking uh, of a brain. And uh, this is further continued when we look uh, at, at this painting from, uh, from Michelangelo. And again, here, the neck uh, looks a little bit atypical and, and some colleagues have the hypothesis that again, uh, Michelangelo has drawn a, a brain into this uh, painting. And I would like uh, to, to emphasize that we, of course, cannot uh, know and, and perhaps will never know what, uh, what Michelangelo had, had thought when he was drawing it and whether he had indeed a brain in mind. Uh, but independently from that, many people see a brain in it. And, and there is an agreement among several of us that indeed the shape looks very much like the shape uh, of a brain. 
And um, I'm, I'm very pleased that we have an expert today here, Professor Ian uh, Tattersall, who is uh, an expert uh, in cognition and uh, also uh, knows uh, philosophy uh, in very much detail. And I'm sure uh, that he can uh, answer several of the questions uh, that um, might be asked with respect uh, to arts and to these uh, symbolic forms. But culture also, uh, or evolution came also up. Um, um, and uh, this, this is structure of the brain and this incredible difficult network of connections that we see in the brain. And on the left hand side, you see such a natural neuronal network, which was created during evolution. Uh, and since the 50s of the last century, we also see the development of artificial neuronal networks. And what you see here is a uh, is simple perceptron. Uh, and also then uh, in the next uh, few seconds, you will see a multilayer perceptron. And although there are many similarities between these two types of networks, there are also many differences. And many of my colleagues are excited to learn uh, from natural new, uh, neuronal networks, how can we create uh, artificial neuronal networks and perhaps improve their capacities and, and make them more powerful. And this is the whole, um, this is the whole research uh, direction that is uh, more and more coming up in these years. And there are incredible results when we are looking to what these artificial neuronal networks can create and two years, uh, two years ago, there, there was at Christie's uh, a selling of an artwork that was the result uh, of artificial intelligence for more than $400,000. And we know that some artworks produced by human beings are also sold for the same amount of money. And this is an example here from, from Richter. And um, we, can, we can ask ourselves, uh, Will we accept uh, in, in the future to pay huge amount of monies for, for something which is a result of artificial intelligence? And will we attribute uh, such a value to uh, such an art piece in the future? Will this change the whole uh, art world and the whole culture that we are doing? Also, we of course know that uh, such an art world is reproducible up to the uh, to the smallest bits and, and bytes. So these are, uh, of course, uh, questions uh, which I find uh, very interesting and uh, to, to be answered in the future. And we could also ask ourselves, and I would ask myself, when, when we have the next collection uh, of the Fashion Week, um, will we distinguish whether this, uh, this fashion is designed by a human designer or by an artificial program? And can we really make a difference by humankind designing as compared uh, to artificial designing uh, that we have uh, seen uh, in this last painting? And uh, this brings me uh, to our next speaker and uh, which is Professor Jedan Segev who is working on neurons and uh, he and his colleagues are drawing beautiful images out of these neurons. And by looking to these beautiful images, we can start to classify uh, the cells of neurons uh, with respect uh, to their morphology. And this morphology, uh, that is the shape of the cell, is very closely related to their function, to their physiology. But people do not only draw these beautiful cellular um, um, cellular paintings, but they also measure every single detail about these cells. They quantify how big are the dendrites, how big are the branches, and they relate it to other properties of these cells in order to get a better understanding of uh, how these cells are functioning. And you see that there is a lot of different cells uh, that have been found uh, in the brain which all differ with respect to their precise properties. So I would say that every single cell is a little bit uh, like a single universe. However, all these cells are embedded uh, in a context. They are part of a certain layer in the, uh, in the brain, part of a certain brain area. And these brain areas have a certain architecture. 
And uh, I'm particularly interested in the cellular architecture of the human brain. Why? Well, in the same way as uh, New York has a very clear architecture, rectangular one uh, with boroughs and uh, the, the houses are built in blocks. And this makes New York so specific. While when you have a look to Paris, for example, um, then in Paris you have um, um, these uh, departments which are oriented uh, in, a, uh, in a different way. And the way how Paris and New York are organized with respect to their houses um, has a role, of course, has an impact of how these cities are functioning and how the transport is being organized um, in, these two, in these two cities. So it's not only important to uh, count uh, the number of houses, it's also important to see how these houses are arranged and how they form quarters and uh, what does have it for consequences when, when we are looking to the function of the cities. And the same is true when we look to the human brain. We see uh, that the many, many cells, and there are about 86 billion nerve cells, they are arranged uh, in cellular columns, they are arranged in layers, in areas, and the way how they are organized has a lot uh, to do what the areas are responsible for and in which networks they are involved in. And uh, to make such information about the cellular architecture of the human brain available, this was a part of our mission to develop the, the ULIC Brain Atlas. And uh, this is, of course, only one aspect of human brain organization, but it allows to integrate other aspects, other facets of brain organization, including the connectivity or the molecular architecture or cognitive function or genes. And um, in the Human Brain Project, uh, we are developing such an atlas where people can collaborate. And I'm deeply convinced that the culture of scientific collaboration, this is indeed something which is very human and very specific for us humans. And uh, saying that, um, I would like to finish my short introduction and hand over to Professor Ian Tattersell, who is uh, currently Curator Emeritus in the Division of Anthropology in the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Uh, he is an author of more than 400 uh, publications and what I find so impressive also that many, many of these publications uh, have, to have as a target the broad audience. So he is one of the translators uh, of science research uh, to the broader public. Um, Ian Tattersell is a paleoanthropologist and primatologist. He has worked uh, in Africa and is interested in fossils. But interestingly, he is uh, making uh, the bridge between fossils and human cognition. And uh, I'm, I feel uh, very pleased now to give uh, the word to Professor Tattersell um, to talk about uh, culture as the ultimate expression of evolution. Well, thank you very much indeed, Catherine, for that very nice uh, introduction. And hello, everybody. And it's a real privilege for me to be participating in this remarkable video workshop on culture and consciousness under the auspices of the uh, Prada Foundation and organized under very difficult uh, conditions. Now, I've been asked to uh, talk about culture as the ultimate expression of evolution. And of course, I'm happy to try to do that. But in order to do so, I need first to dispel one common misapprehension, namely that culture is a unique possession of our own species, Homo sapiens. That's not actually the case, because in its strictest sense, Culture is defined <clears throat> as, <clears throat> excuse me, as the passing down through the generations of behaviors that are learned by individuals in particular segments of a population of a species. And in the light of this definition, we can find culture much more widely in nature than you might think. Indeed, uh, one study not long ago 
identified 39 separate and distinct cultural behaviors in our near relatives, the chimpanzees, of which you see one here. Now, those cultural expressions range from the ways in which these apes clasp their hands uh, through the manner in which the males perform their sexual displays and all the way to the ways in which they make and use tools to fish for termites, as we see one young individual learning how to do in this particular picture. And what's more, at least 13 different traditions of locally learned behaviors have also been identified among capuchin monkeys in South and Central America, most famously in the uh, techniques that they use for smashing nuts on anvils, as you see one of them uh, doing here. And even dolphins learn locally how to use tools from their peers. And uh, this instance is uh, the use of a sponge to protect the mouth, uh, the snout, uh, during foraging, uh, which is just one population, which just one population of dolphins does. So, the bottom line is that culture is not unique to our species or even to us and our very close extinct relatives. But what is unique is the unusual form of consciousness through which we human beings process our cultural learning. And quite frankly, the acquisition of this strange uh, cognitive style of ours changed all of the rules that govern the interactions of individuals with others of their species and with the world around them. So I need to emphasize that from now on, I'm going to be talking about culture in the specifically human sense and not in its general sense. And that distinction is really important because it reflects a fundamental difference in the way in which modern humans process information about the world. To uh, the best of our knowledge, all other organisms in the world perceive and experience their environments in a holistic way as sort of integrated wholes. Whereas in contrast, we human beings mentally deconstruct our environments into vocabularies of discrete but abstract mental symbols. And this atomization actually applies to our inner experience as well as to our experience of the external world. And once we've done this deconstruction, we can recombine those symbols according to rules to come up with new statements about the world. Not just about the world as it is right now, as we are looking at it, but as the world might be. So in other words, we can imagine worlds other than the one that we live in, and we can plan for those worlds. Now, this is a radically new and unusual ability that we have. And as a result of it, and alone among all organisms, as far as we know, we human beings do not live in the world as it directly presents itself to us. Instead, for most of the time, we live in the version of the world that we reconstruct in our minds. And because we both perceive and reason symbolically, that world is in large part our own individual construct. But then again, each of us will recreate our own world in our own idiosyncratic way. And exactly how we do that will be deeply dependent, not only on our individual quirks, but on the cultural beliefs that we have learned from our earliest infancy. And it is that culturally mediated learning of common behavioral rules that explains why even while we inhabit our own separate individual worlds, individuals can coexist in the complex societies that we have created. <clears throat> but of equal importance, 
culture also provides the underpinnings of our individual identities. And our ability to absorb culture in this context stems directly from our strange cognitive style. And that style, of course, in turn mediates the quality of our consciousness, both as individuals and as members of our rather unusual species. Well, all of these things suggest that if we're going to understand the unique relationship that there is between culture and consciousness in our species, we would do very well to look back and to reconsider uh, how both aspects of humanity evolve. And in this particular uh, endeavor, it's culture that has the advantage because it has a direct, if incomplete, material reflection in the archaeological record, of which we see an early example here. The archaeological record is the physical record or register of ancient human behaviors, and it really consists of cultural behaviors. Whereas if we want to, to, to know about symbolic consciousness or the form of consciousness that existed in earlier kinds of humans, we have to indirectly uh, infer that from the uh, archaeological record. Anyway, Let's take a quick look at, our, at history with the assumption that our earliest ancestor, who was not ancestral to any ape, that is to say, the earliest hominid, uh, that this creature already had a relatively complex cognitive system that was basically comparable to that of the uh, quite sophisticated modern apes that we can observe. And in broad terms, at least, this assumption seems to be a reasonable one to make, and it's not really contradicted by anything that we currently know. So accordingly, the first material um, suggestion that we have of any significant uh, cognitive advance relative to the apes comes at some point over about two and a half million uh, years ago, with the deliberate manufacture of the first stone tools. Those early tools consisted mainly of small, sharp flakes, like the one that we see in this image here, that were knocked off one fist-sized cobble of stone using another piece of stone. Now, this activity required a degree of imagination and mental insight, in addition to the obvious manual dexterity that was needed. And it also often involved conscious planning as suitable materials were carried around the landscape before they were made into tools as they were needed for cutting whatever. Now, these first stone tools appear to have been made by early hominids with small stature, small brains, and archaic body proportions. And we wouldn't normally regard uh, these forms as human, ruling out the old formula of uh, man, the toolmaker. In fact, the first toolmakers would not have looked very different from the individuals that we see here. And the tools that they manufactured would clearly have made a huge difference in their lives and in what they were capable of doing. Although there is no way for us to observe that difference directly. For example, the tools, these early flake tools, would have allowed the quick butchery of carcasses, parts of which could be removed to be consumed in places that was safer than being right around a carcass uh, for which there would be a huge amount of competition from dangerous uh, predators and scavengers. <coughs> Excuse me. And the use of these tools also made available animal fats and proteins that provided a high quality energetic basis 
for the process of brain enlargement that was shortly going to begin. Now, significantly, about a million years passed after the appearance of the first stone tools, before the next conceptual advance in stone tool making occurred. Now that innovation involved carefully shaping a stone core according to a template that must have existed in the mind of the stone tool maker before they started. This was the result of a deliberate attempt to achieve a tool of that form. Unlike a sharp flake, which could look like uh, anything, uh, but just needed to have a sharp edge. And following this procedure gave us this so-called hand axe, of which we see an example here. Now this tool type clearly represents the arrival of a more complex conceptualization of the potential that's inherent in stone as a material. But alas, we do not have a good record of any more general cognitive advances that may have accompanied it. Something was going on, but we can't tell exactly what it was. But we can infer that those lifestyle and cognitive changes were there because these tools appeared shortly after our own genus Homo had come onto the scene at a little under two million years ago. And even the earliest Homo that we know had effectively modern body proportions that signal a dramatic ecological shift away from the ancestral woodlands and toward the open savanna, as you see represented in this diorama here. So here at last, a little bit under two million years ago, was an obligate biped, a biped that had definitively left the shelter of the woodlands in favor of a life out in the open bushlands and savanna. And this represented a huge change in lifestyle, in ecological zone. And some experts even believe that adaptation to the new environment must have involved the uh, mastery of fire although there is no actual evidence in the record for fire use before about a million years ago. And hearths, that is to say campfire sites, only became a routine feature of occupation sites after about 400,000 years ago. So this is still, the jury is still out on this one. But significantly, it was yet another million years before the next innovation in stone tool making was made. And uh, that, uh, in this case, a stone core, a large stone core, was laboriously prepared until a single blow would detach it uh, from that core, a quasi-finished tool with a continuous cutting surface all around it, like the one that you see in the uh, foreground here. You've got the core behind, and you have the flake uh, in finished flake in front. Now, all of this shows very clearly that hominids were becoming culturally and presumably cognitively more sophisticated over the length of the Pleistocene period, the last couple of million years. But <clears throat> the visible technological pattern was simply one of very occasional major innovation rather than one of gradual improvement. We are used today to a world in which technological innovation is constant, but that is the exception. And that, as I'm going to show you, is something very, very, very recent uh, in the uh, human record. Uh, now, fueled by a better diet, uh, hominid brain sizes, as you see in this very crude chart, were enlarging over this uh, period as well. And it seems that such enlargement was actually occurring independently in at least three separate lineages within the genus Homo. And that makes it fair to suggest, at least in retrospect, 
that throughout this process, members of the genus Homo were employing an intuitive cognitive algorithm in which intelligence, however you might want to define it, basically scaled with uh, brain size. But there's a price to be paid because big brains are costly things because brain tissue is energetically very demanding. Your brain probably weighs uh, only a couple of percent of your total body weight, but at times it may even be using up to 25% of the energy that you are expending. And presumably, those bigger hominid brains were paying back that higher cost by supporting more complex cultural styles that in turn allowed hominids to exploit the environment around them more effectively. But alas, we have very little material evidence that bears on exactly what was going on in this process. Now, our own large brain uh, species and very anatomically distinctive species, I should say, Homo sapiens appeared on the scene in Africa uh, following around about 200,000 years ago, as testified by fossils such as this one from Ethiopia. But there was no corresponding change in the nature of the accompanying archaeological record. The new hominid, big brain and all, was apparently still behaving in the same old way. And the first indication we have of any quantitative, qualitative change, uh, I should say, in cognitive style came only about 100,000 years later when we begin to find items of bodily decoration being produced as basically products of the human ego. These decorative items come in the force of pierced shell beads like the ones that we see in this illustration here. And they're found in both Mediterranean and Southern African sites in the period following about 100,000 years ago. Many of these beads bear traces of color, probably from contact with ochre painted human skin. And that observation is important, not only for its aesthetic overtones, but because bodily decoration almost always has symbolic implications. Those implications are usually about the economic or the social status or the social affiliation of the individual concerned. But whatever they are, they are invariably making a statement. And once more, we don't have very long to wait for more direct indications uh, that humans had adopted this symbolic reasoning algorithm. Because at around 80,000 years ago, in Southern Africa again, we find the first overtly symbolic objects of which this one here that we see on the screen is the best and the most complete. It was found at this spectacularly sighted cave of Blombos uh, near Africa's southern tip. And the object concerned, as you can see, is a carefully smooth ochre plaque that is engraved with a distinctive geometrical pattern. And that pattern apparently uh, retained its symbolic meaning over time because it's found repetitively on plaque fragments that were discovered at different levels, archaeological levels, within the site. And what's more, Slightly younger sites not far away have yielded comparable symbolic objects, such as these colored and engraved ostrich eggshell fragments. These ones come from a place called Dierpluf. Now, perhaps most telling of all though, is <clears throat> that once the symbolic behavioral repertoire had been established, our species rapidly spread throughout Africa and beyond, as you can see in this rather crude map. And in spreading, 
in a very short time, it eliminated all other competing uh, hominids uh, in the process. In Eastern Asia, for example, a hominid relative Homo erectus rapidly disappeared after it had been there for more than a million years. And at the other end of the Eurasian continent in Europe, our even closer relative Homo neanderthalensis quickly vanished. And perhaps even more eloquently, the quintessentially symbolic tradition of Ice Age representative art was soon established. Images such as this one were being made in Borneo and Sulawesi, right over there in Eastern Asia, over 40,000 years ago. And at roughly the same time, we have the astounding fluorescence of cave art in Europe, of which this is a very familiar early example. And this enormous outpouring brought with it also music, as exemplified by this bone flute. And it brought with it notations, exemplified by this, uh, what is possibly been interpreted anyway as a lunar calendar on a uh, reindeer antler plaque. And it brought with it sculpture as epitomized by this exquisite tiny horse from Germany. Now images like this one are the clearest evidence you could wish for that after millions of years of hominid evolution, the, hom the modern hominid sensibility had finally arrived and that cultures in the way in which we understand them uh, uh, today were developing. So what had happened? Well, I think the simplest hypothesis is that the neural wiring that uh, permits symbolic thought was acquired in the profound developmental event that gave rise to the very anatomically distinctive Homo sapiens. And that event really did involve major biological change. As you can see by comparing the Neanderthal skeleton on the left here with a modern Homo sapiens on the right. Uh, there is a huge, uh, the Neanderthal is more representative of a typical member of the genus Homo. And you can see the radical changes from the head to the feet um, in, the, uh, in, in the modern human. Now, the record only gives us bones like these ones. But the same change must have involved alterations in the soft tissues of the body as well. And evidently those soft tissues included the brain. And those alterations evidently gave Homo sapiens a new cognitive potential. But as is often the case, that potential was not realized until it was released behaviorally. And that release must have been accomplished by a cultural stimulus, because necessarily the biology was already there. Because after all, there's no way you can uh, exhibit a new behavior unless you already have the biology that permits it. So what was that cultural stimulus? Well, I'm pretty convinced that, um, the, uh, that it was the uh, spontaneous development of language. After all, with its uh, lexicon of vocal symbols, language maps more or less perfectly onto the particular nature of symbolic reasoning. And it's also happened that uh, structured sign languages have been observed to develop spontaneously and suddenly and that fits very well with the widely held belief that the basic operation underlying language is fairly algorithmically simple. And once meanings could be attached to sounds by correlating them with objects in a brain that was already structured to make associations, this feedback system could easily have emerged that quickly established the symbolic mode of information processing that we take for granted today. Incidentally, this new symbolic algorithm for processing information seems to have been energetically much more efficient 
than its brute, brute force uh, predecessor. Because that's the best explanation we have for why, after a very long history of enlargement, our brains have actually shrunk almost 13% in volume over the last few tens of thousands of years, as you can see from this table. But even more significantly though, I think all this means that modern humans did not, as many suppose, acquire their remarkable cognitive powers gradually over the eons, under the guiding pressures of natural selection. Instead, we acquired those powers very recently and very suddenly and through a process that involved exaptation rather than adaptation. We have evidently not been fine-tuned by eons of natural selection to be the kind of creature we are. And if you think about it, this combination of suddenness and adventitiousness explains a lot about our brilliantly creative yet patently imperfected species, which is notoriously a bundle of paradoxes. And it also says something about the nature of our culture. In its rudiments, culture is widespread in nature, as I uh, mentioned earlier. But there's something very unusual about culture as processed through the human symbolic capacity. Not only is culture a driving force in human societies, but it actually underpins those societies because we are literally dependent on our cultures to survive. To take one extreme example, bilbies like this one here can survive in the arid Australian outback because they have physiological adaptations that allow them to do so. And all of the bilbies can do it. But humans can only survive in the Australian outback if they have the rare cultural knowledge that allows them to do so. Without that cultural knowledge, we're goners in that kind of environment. So we human beings are entirely culturally dependent. And the archeological record clearly shows that from the very beginning, we have felt a profound need to express the cultures that make us who we are both as societies and as individuals. Now, evolution produces diversity and every species living in the world is a terminal twig on the luxuriously branching tree of life that we see here. And Homo sapiens is just one of those many millions of species. So it is perhaps a bit egocentric to suggest that Homo sapiens, and by extension, the exquisitely modulated form of culture that makes us who we are, is the ultimate expression of evolution. You could argue that there are in fact many of those ultimate expressions, but what it is entirely legitimate to say is that culture is the ultimate expression of being human. And I've argued elsewhere that uh, in fact, there is very little reason to imagine that our species under current demographic conditions will evolve much in the, uh, in, in the future, biologically speaking. But there is a tremendous amount of exploration of our cultural potential uh, to be done. And that is where the action will be in the future. So thank you everybody for listening and do stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian, for this insightful talk. And before we open uh, your talk for discussion, I would like to invite our second speaker, who is uh, Yidan Segev. Yidan Segev is a professor for computational neuroscience at the Edmond and Lili Safra Center for Brain Science in Jerusalem, a very well-known uh, brain science center in the world. And Yidan is in particular interested in networks of the, uh, of the brain and how they can be mathematically described in models 
and being simulated. He is also very much interested in brain and arts and has organized in the past uh, several meetings in that respect and exhibitions at the center. And he was also active very much uh, in, um, in, in, in educating uh, children with respect uh, to science uh, and to art, uh, also uh, by, by different channels, uh, through exhibitions, uh, workshops, and through a journal. So I'm very much pleased uh, that Yedan Segev is today uh, here and will speak about uh, the design for a creative brain, a topic uh, that I'm sure uh, will raise uh, a lot of questions uh, which we are happy to receive. So Yedan, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Katrin. And uh, thank you, Jan, for this wonderful talk, really very well. Uh, going with my talk, so we, we shall uh, co complement each other. And, but also to Prada, uh, I think it's very innovative, very creative what Prada is doing. Actually, I'm proud of Prada uh, and that they combine this, decided to combine art, fashion and art and brain. I think it's a wonderful idea. Uh, I'm very proud to be part of it. I'm, uh, I'm very happy. And so today I, would, uh, I will try to, uh, to do something, uh, so to speak, a little bit unusual because I'm going to speak about a very difficult uh, topic uh, that Jan raised, uh, what is uh, unique about human brain, what makes us uh, so specific, why do we succeed to create art and technology and fashion. Uh, there will be a little bit of some ideas, not necessarily complete proof, but I'll be happy to hear Katrin, especially as a brain expert about what I'm saying. So let's, let's start. So, so let's see. So let me start with Einstein. We cannot not start with Einstein. This is probably the most creative scientist uh, we ever knew because you know, in 1905, Einstein, this is the miraculous year. Einstein did, you know, four amazing uh, papers with his uh, creative brain and he said that the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and science. As I said, uh, Prada is really trying to connect art and science in this uh, set of, of lectures. Uh, and, and both of them, both art and science is really the ultimate creativity. You, you start from, from an idea and then something comes up Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo that Catherine mentioned, and I will mention more. And so I want to ask the question is, what is unique in our brain, as much as we can say, that enable us to be so creative? There is no doubt that we are the most creative creature uh, living today. We create all the time. We create meetings. We create Zoom. We create medicine against things and so on. What makes us so creative? What is unique about our brain? So I will start my talk here with point one, just very, very quick outlook about creativity, very quick, because Jan already said uh, certain things, several things about this. And then I want to inject and I want to introduce a notion uh, of a brain state. I want to tell you that a brain, what is a state of a brain? What does it mean when you speak about the brain is in a state of sleep or in a state of Parkinson or in a creative state? What does it mean to be in a state? And I want, to, uh, I want to emphasize and I want to try to convince you that our brain developed tools to become, to, to have many, many states, many new states. One of them is a creative state or many states. So we have the tools, we have the anatomy, we have the physiology that provo provide or improve our capability to, to, to be in states, in new states that other brains cannot be. And this enables us to be creative. And then I'll go with, with a few speculations here about what makes our brain unique in that sense that is supporting the foundation of creativity. I think creativity is the most beautiful thing that human doing, uh, being to do. We can use creativity, of course, for destruction. We can use the creativity for doing beautiful things like art and science. And along my talk, I want to show some beautiful creative things that came from brain research in particular, the Blue Brain project that I'm part of. So let me start with the two most creative people in my mind in the 20th century. I already mentioned Einstein and uh, 
Pablo Picasso here on the right. And they said, two, two of them said something about creativity that we should listen to. So of course, uh, Picasso being an artist and intuitive, he said the most important things is to create. Nothing, nothing else matter. Creation is all. Well, it's very unique to our brain to create. Einstein said something deeper in a sense. He said, the human mind has first to construct forms, to imagine. Jan mentioned imagination, to imagine things independently before we can find them in things. So we generate hypotheses, we generate idea or possibilities, and then we look after these possibilities was raised in our brain due to the capability to imagine things and you look for them or you find them or not in the environment. Other artists like for example, uh, Juan Miro, who said something very beautiful in my mind, art is the attempt to find the alphabet of the mind. I would say as a scientist, that science is also an attempt to find the alphabet of nature. And brain science is an attempt to find the alphabet of the mind. So the fundamental principles that enable my brain to function. We don't want to describe every detail. We want to find the alphabet, the principles. So that's a very beautiful idioms by, by Miro. Uh, you know that I'm, as uh, Catherine mentioned, I like art a lot and I think art and science should go together. We'll talk about this at the end. And so I think we can learn a lot from artists and many of the time, many times artists envision things much, much before scientists found them in reality much, much before. So I think we can learn a lot from artists about how to do science or what to think about as a scientist. Brancusi spoke about the essence of things. Again, you know, how do you reduce the details, how you reduce the complex things you are trying to understand as a brain scientist or as an artist to the minimum, the birdiness of the bird or the head, the headiness of the head or the kisses, the kiss of the kissiness, yes? The minimal kiss that capture the kissiness, the notion of kiss. Science and art are trying to do similar things in many ways, but with different tools. We, you heard a lot from Jan, Jan about brain evolution, so I'm not going to say much, but I just want to emphasize one thing again, that during these 200,000, or people now speak about 300,000 years of, uh, so, sorry, of, of Homo sapiens, uh, of, of, of what is called the cultural evolution, all this yellow region uh, along the years, there is no genetic change. So if you look at the, the genome of a person, of a, of, a, of a fossil that we can do with ancient DNA today, and you compare the DNA of this person to ours today, there is no big difference. That's why I can say that we are homo sapiens, we are the same genetic animal, the same genetic species. So how come that everything was there and suddenly along the years, as Jan mentioned, you know, suddenly there is art some 3,000, 6,000 years ago and there is written language and suddenly there is science and suddenly there are computers and suddenly there are iPhones and machine learning and brain simulations and viral detection and vaccination and who knows what is coming. How come with the same brain with the same structure, with the same physiology, you continuously do new things. That's, that's almost a miracle in terms of the brain, yes? So that's what I'm going to try to, to, uh, to look at, to try to answer. But I cannot not show you, of course, these beautiful things because this is in, in my mind, the ultimate things that the art did, uh, this, uh, this prehistoric caves that Jan mentioned already. And let's go to tell you a little bit about brain states because I think that what is unique about our brain is that the capability to, to, be, to have new states of brain and these new states of the brain are correlated with new things that we do, we do, including brain, art, science, creativity, and so forth. So just to show you to all of you, or maybe you know already, there is this elementary, elementary unit in the brain. It's called a neuron, a nerve cell. It's a complicated structure and we are studying it a lot. But for this talk, I just want to mention that this element that is called nerve cell, the neuron, is an electrical device. It generates electrical signals. And you can hear here what would have happened if I would record 
from the cell body here, from this black spot with this electrode, what will happen if I will put an electrode in my brain or your brain or a mouse brain and record what, what's going on there? And you will see there is this electrical activity, we call them spikes, which fire sometimes spontaneously or sometimes in response to some external stimulus like this. Let me see. Okay, so this is the individual activity of a single unit, neuro, neuron in the brain, any brain. So this is the elementary microchip that does all this computation, that generate ideas, that enables me to talk now, that enables you to, to, to listen, to think, to sleep. This is the elementary unit. But of course, we have a lot of them. We shall talk about numbers in a second. Katrin already mentioned that our brain has 86 billion elements like this. It's a huge number of elements interacting, and this interaction generates states, dynamical states of interacting elements with one another. And to show you what I mean by a state, I want to take an example, which is a difficult example, but it's easy to understand through this example, and I want to show you a state of a Parkinsonian brain. What does it mean, a state of a Parkinson? So I show you, this is a work by Hagai Bergman from our work, who was one of the first to record with these electrodes from a brain of a monkey in this case, or, but also a human today. We can record before operation this activity. So you, you put an electrode in the living brain and you record in this case from three cells, three, three neurons. One neuron is doing this activity, ta 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 stop and so on. The other, the other nerve cell here, this is the middle one, is, is active more rigorously, ta 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 The third one is, is, is active less, ta 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 ta. So each neuron has its own kind of electrical music, if you want, and together they generate this philharmonic music. The philharmonic music of a non-Parkinsonian person looks like this. Each neuron is different a little bit, and together about a million neurons generate this in this particular region of the brain, a global activity, a state, non-Parkinsonian state. But if you record from a Parkinsonian patient, from similar neurons in the same region, you suddenly see that the neurons generate different electrical activity. For example, this neuron is doing ta-ta-ta-ta-ta stop, like a machine gun, ta-ta-ta-ta stop. Okay, and then there is a second neuron, and then there is a third neuron, and apparently all the neurons remaining in this region of the brain, the basal ganglia, start to fire together, synchronously, like a machine gun. And this wrong state, this electrical state that suddenly becomes Parkinsonian, is reflected by a Parkinsonian state. So you, your behavior, you know, the, the, the activity, the muscle activity, the movement is tremor and all that is related to Parkinson. So these are two brain states. This is a normal, so to speak, brain state, and this is a Parkinsonian brain state. And so I want to claim that all that we do uh, can be defined as a state of the brain. You are now alert, you listen to my talk, you have a particular brain state that enables you to understand what I'm saying. I am in a state that I'm talking now, I'm moving my hands now, it's a brain state. And to show you that we can interfere with the brain state and manipulate the brain sta uh, state and to correct Parkinson, I want to show you really an enormous and ad advanced, uh, what is called, a, you know, the deep brain stimulation. So if you are a Parkinsonian patient and this region here generate this electrical activity, this state of Parkinson, you can interfere, you can inject current through a generator, through a battery, that is implanted like, like, like in a pacemaker of the heart, you can pacemake the brain, you can pacemaker the brain, you can inject current in the brain and correct while you inject the activity of this region. And I, so I want to show you an example of a Parkinsonian patient here. So this is a Parkinsonian patient in Hadassah Medical School in Jerusalem that agreed to be photographed, to be video, so you can see a, a very severe, actually young person, 56 years old, that is Parkinsonian. And I don't need to show you how difficult it is for this person to move and to do things that is so easy for you like this to do. It's very difficult for, for him to do. 
So this is a Parkinsonian state. His brain generates this electrical activity, which is spontaneous, which is automatic. You cannot get rid of it, so you are Parkinsonian. Okay? But if you take this electrode that I mentioned before here into the brain of this patient, which is a very fast operation today, and you, you, you put the electrode in the correct location, then the same person, after this fast operation, actually completely alert, you can talk to him while you penetrate with a very thin electrode to the correct location, this same person is looking like that. So this person that you see now walking on the left side is the same person just after the operation. Now he's getting electrical stimulus, changing the brain state, changing the state of his brain into a normal brain activity, and he's doing things that a Parkinsonian patient cannot do. So this was an example of what does it mean a brain state, electrical brain state, and how can I manipulate the brain state from one state to another through a technology, brain machine interface. Okay, so after introducing this brain state, I want to say that something in this human being some 24,000 years ago here or in Germany or in Austria or in Italy much later by Michelangelo, he had a st special brain state that enabled him you know, to create David or you know, David and so on. It's a state. The question is what makes us unique in terms of being able to be in these states? What makes us so creative? So I want to start with something to negate something. It's not the, it's not the size of the brain. It's not the size of the brain. Catherine can tell you a lot about different brain of clever people, of unique people, unique personalities. She's an anatomist, she knows more than me. But I can tell you that Einstein's brain was very small, 1.2 kilogram. It's much smaller than your brain, all of you. And Anatole France, both Nobel laureates, was even smaller brain, 1.1 kilogram, very, very small. Your brain is 1.4, 1.3, 1.5. So there is no connection between these genius people and the size of the brain. It's not the size of the brain. That, that's not, so bigger brains are not more creative than smaller brains. Okay? But Catherine mentioned something very important. We do have a huge number of cells. So if you compare mammalian brain from the smallest mammal to the bigger mammal, to chimpanzees and so on, to macaque monkey, you compare it to our brain, we have huge amount of microchips, huge, huge amount, 86 billion elements interacting electrically with one another. There is a huge combinatorial, a huge combina combination of activity that you can do with 86 billion and you cannot do with two neurons. So if I had two neurons, I could be either one zero, zero one, zero zero, or one one. I had only four states. With 86 billion, we have huge amount of permutation or combination of activity, many states. So that's one idea. We are creative partially because we have the substance in terms of huge num number of microchips, of computing elements, of neurons. There are animals with more brain cells. There are dolphins with bigger number of brain cells. So it's certainly not the only thing that makes us creative but it's part of the things, certainly part of the things that enable our brain to be in many brain states. Another aspect that is unique to our brain, again, Catherine is here. She can tell you more about the anatomy, gross anatomy of the brain. But if you use this technology, which is called diffusion tangential imaging technology, which enables you to see the connectivity, the connection, the axons, the wires that go from one region in the mouse to another region in the mouse, and you compare the connectivity, the white matter, the axons going from one region to another region in the chimpanzee and in the human brain using the same technology, you see huge connectivity between regions. Our brain evolved through genetic, genetic and, and evolution into a, into a brain that is highly interconnected between regions. Actually, much of our brain is what we call the white matter. The white matter is this wiring connectivity. And Catherine is one of the top 
person in the world that, that works on this connectivity between regions. And why is it so important? Why is it to, for creativity? Why this interconnectivity is important for creativity? Because when you want to generate symbols, like Jan spoke about symbols, let's, let's say that we are now agreeing that we have a symbol that is called glass. I'm using the symbol glass. So when I'm saying now glass, all of you are thinking about the shape of the glass. It has a shape, but it also has a taste because inside the glass, there is a juice. But also when you think about glass, you think about the, the, the feeling of the glass, whether it's from plastic, is it from uh, glass? What is this? So, so, so just by saying the symbol glass, I just said the symbol glass, I actually mean visual symbol, somatosensory touch symbol, taste symbol, at least three different aspects combined together to the notion of glass, to the symbol of glass. But how can a brain connect something that is visual here in this region, something that relates to touch in this region, something that relates to smell in this region, something that relates to taste of the juice or the coffee in this region, when I think about glass, you need connectivity. Otherwise, there will be a visual glass disconnected with a taste glass, disconnected with a smell glass. So this intense connectivity enables us to generate symbols. And as Jan mentioned, symbols are everything because you manipulate symbols, you enable symbols to integrate, you, 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 you create poetry by shifting symbols. I create lecture by moving symbols around and I'm talking to you and these symbols go to your ear and you understand. So symbols are essential for creativity and connectivity in the brain in my mind is absolutely the basis for generating integrative way of thinking about a symbol, a glass, a face, and so on. So that's my second hypothesis about what is unique about our brain. It's highly connected. The mouse cannot create a symbol of a glass because his visual system is not so intensely connected to his smell system and so on. The third thing is what happens locally in a local region, very small cubic millimeter region in our brain. So this comes from the Blue Brain Project, which is a simulation of pieces of brain. I'm not going to go into details, but I promised you beautiful pictures, which is also artistic. So if you look at a cubic millimeter, just one cubic millimeter of your brain, in this case, actually, it's the brain of a mouse or a rodent, you see a very, very dense local circuit not between region, but local, very, very dense local connectivity. This is, all, this is true for all mammals. If you look at the brain of a mouse or of, of, of a monkey, it's very, 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 very dense locally. But there is something unique about the human brain. I promise you beautiful pictures because it's an artistic talk as well. So this is from the Blue Brain Project. You can see a piece of, your, of the cortex of the mouse with different type of cells different type of nerve cells, very beautiful brain. The brain actually is a very beautiful thing on its own. In the blue brain, we are trying to simulate a whole piece, the whole brain of a mouse. This is now the, one of the first whole cortex, 10 million cells in the computer, simulated one by one. And again, you can see it's very, very beautiful piece of art that actually was supposed to be in the Pompidou Center in Paris if there was no Corona. So what is unique about the brain in terms of local connectivity? And you can see here two things that are important in my mind for generating the capability to become creative. One thing is this slowness of development of the human brain. You can see on A here on left, a brain of a one month old child. And you can see the local circuit, the local neurons in the cortex, in the cortex of this young child, post-mortem, you can see it's a sparse network. It's a sparse network. But if you go to the six years old child here, the brain became bigger, much more nerve cells, much more connectivity, much more synapses between cells in this region. But it took six years for our brain to evolve, to develop, 
to a brain of a mature brain, which looks like this also in your brain, a mature brain, six years. So the slowness of development in my mind, the fact that we develop so slow relative, let's say to the chimpanzee to become mature in terms of brain, this slowness of development enables us to absorb the complicated environment, the expectation of our parents, the, the complicated world around us, you know, Trump, this Biden, here and there, what do we need? And, and, and the expectation of my parents to, to, to interact with me, the mother, the father, the uncle, it's a very complicated world, which we have time to absorb if we develop slowly. But if you develop within two or three months to a mature brain, you will not be able to absorb all this complexity and create a model, so to speak, of the brain, of the environment around you. So the slowness of development is important, very important. And there are genes that regulate our development so that we won't develop fast. There are cases where this system does not work. There are kids that develop very fast, much faster than needed, and they are not capable of interacting with a complex world. Also, if you look at this, uh, uh, this graph, this diagram, you can see that in terms of the number of contacts that a single nerve cell receives from its neighbors, the number of synapses per a single unit is about twice in human, this is the black bar here, relative to the mouse, to the rodent. So we are much more locally connected, not only globally between regions, but also within region, the human connectivity is very, very big. Why is it important? because it gives me a lot of brain states, a lot of local perturbation of activity, a lot of states. Both the global interaction and also the local interactions gives me a huge number of possibilities in terms of brain activity to enable me to absorb or to create, to be ready for the future, to generate a new future, because I have all these states that enable me to interact with it. Just uh, one thing, uh, Catherine mentioned that we are working on human cells, human cells relative to the red cells. We can see today, we have a mathematical models of these two elements and we can show that in terms of the computation of this microchip, the capability to, to do sophisticated computation, this human microchip, the human cell is much more sophisticated than the red cell. So this is an addition to our capability to do interesting things. And finally, just before I finish, I want to inject something that is a little bit more complicated than, than what I said, but I think it's very important. A computer, my computer at home, is not creative. It's a, it's a, it's a deterministic machine. It always does the same thing. You press the letter A, A. You press the letter B, B. The, so, and and this, this, this is successful, and you want the machine to do that, that when you do two multiplied by three, it will be six and not suddenly seven, you need to reduce the, the, bio, the, the physical noise, the physical noise that is generated by the element, by the microchips. If the microchip would be noisy, electrically noisy, they will suddenly become wild and you will get three multiplied by two, it will be six, seven, it will be eight. The brain is very noisy. The brain is, is a noisy machine. You can see here, that when you record from a nerve cell, here is a nerve cell, and you record the activity of a nerve cell without any stimulation in a dish, this element is very noisy electrically. It always generates this little, little bump, up, 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 this little bumps. Before it generates the big signal, underlying there is this activity, so brain is, is, is a noisy machine. It's too noisy when it becomes epileptic, but now that I'm talking, it's always a little bit noisy and it never repeats on itself. So when I see, I see A, it's not the same A for me. When I see Catherine, it's not the same Catherine for me. One after the second time, it's always because my brain is always shifting, trying to interpret reality, but under a noisy condition. This is true for the mouse. This is true for the rodent. But we are now finding that human neurons are more noisy Actually, in a different way, the spectrum of noise is somewhat different in human neurons. And to me, creativity comes from the fact that you don't do the same thing again and again. You cannot be deterministic and still be create creative. You should do this different things under the same condition. So our brain 
is uniquely noisy, and this is something very, very important for creativity. I should tell you that when you interview people that are creative, many of them tell, and I, and I spoke with many mathematicians, Nobel laureates, and so on, and asked them, when is the moment of creativity? When is your brain creative? Many of them say, when I'm a little bit sick. Many of them say, just before I go to sleep, I'm not completely alert, aware, but I'm not yet asleep. In this state of in-between, when you have a little bit of fever, the noise becomes bigger. The neuronal noise is, is a temperature dependent. So I'm not, I'm not now suggesting that you should be sick in order to become creative, but I'm saying that people that are creative many times said that good ideas came when they had low fever or when they shifted from one situation to another and they were not too overwhelmed by the environment, the brain was in, allowed to shift uh, spontaneously and it became creative. At that point, there was an idea. So I want to end by asking us, all of us, how can we become more creative? What is called, how can we augment our cognition? All of us want to be more creative. You have the tool, you have the, you have the sub substrate, but how do we become more creative? So it's a book that I edited about machines and, and, and you know, stimulation and pharmaceutical methods, drugs and so on to become more creative. I'm not, sub, I'm, not, I'm not recommending this at all, but I'm recommending the following. First of all, I think that if you want to be creative, that's my little manifesto. This is my little manifesto about how to become creative. I think we should stop actually as Prada is doing to, 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 to stop these dichotomies. You know, I'm a scientist, you are an artist, she is an architect, he is, I don't know what, a driver. All these old dichotomies, especially the dichotomy between science and art is harmful for creativity because I think of many interaction through many interaction with other people that are not from my field. As I said before, between scientists and artists, I think huge interactions can come because of this friction between the two cultures, as C.P. Snow used to call them, the two cultures. But there are many cultures and they should interact. We should not isolate ourselves in an ivory tower and become only scientists. And so this is one call, you know, break this old dichotomy, science, art, and generate, for example, new museums that we should call here the Mars Museum, the Museum of Art and Science. I actually tried many times to go to an art museum and ask them to do a scientific exhibition in the art museum. No, 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 art is art, science is elsewhere. You go to a science museum and said, no, no, we don't do art here, we do science here. I think it's a great mistake, especially for a child that comes to a museum, he should have seen Einstein on the left, let's say, and Picasso on the right, together. They go together. And then we shall have a Leonardo da Vinci brain. So we want to have Leonardo da Vinci's, the da Vinci's, and I think our society should encourage this kind of interaction. So this kind of meeting that we are doing now, I think it's, it's on this direction because we are now interacting with people that typically do not. So I never met Jan, although I read many of his articles. Uh, so I never met Jan and I'm trying to meet people in, not from my field because I know already people from my field and I don't want copy of myself, I want somebody else. So I really very strongly suggest all of you to do this interaction, to do both art and science and all of us should take the example of this amazing genius, Leonardo da Vinci. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I just want to add one last thing. So I describe the brain, because I'm a scientist, I describe our brain as, as a machine. There are nerve cells, synapses, connections, regions. It's true. It's a machine of some sort. But science, I think, has a limitation in terms of what it can really say about the world. So I think Einstein again said the following, it would be possible to describe everything scientifically, but it would make no sense. It would be without meaning, as if you describe a Beethoven symphony as a variation of wave pressures. So science can describe wave pressures 
but science cannot describe the music of Beethoven. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Idan. This was really great and uh, so clearly uh, presented. So um, I'm now happy that we can enter the last part of our meeting today, that is a discussion. And perhaps I would like to uh, forward questions to both of you. We have received some of the questions during the past days, and we have also received uh, some of the questions during the talks. So I try to group them a little bit together and uh, to forward what, what our audience uh, have asked. And perhaps uh, in um, connecting to what you, Yedan, said at the end, uh, I would like uh, to forward this question to Ian. Um, and the question is, people also talk a lot about the division of science and humanities. And in fields like neuroscience, psychology and anthropology, it seems that cultural and scientific approaches are merging. Uh, what is your experience? Is this uh, really a merger that comes close together or uh, is this rather a difficult neighborhood between uh, sciences and art? It is a difficult neighborhood, there's no question about it. And you know, if, if, if the brain is a machine, which it, it must be, there is definitely a ghost in it still. And we haven't identified <clears throat> uh, that ghost yet. So, uh, yeah, I think the science and art, uh, Idan has made a very, very good point. They're mutually illuminating because they're both, both products of the brain. You know, and uh, this, is, this is where they, uh, they definitely uh, do meet. And we have to find somehow, uh, you know, how, how, they, uh, how they interface. And uh, we need both. We need, we need both. But then, Yedan, when I may come back to you, um, um, we, when we think about aesthetics and uh, the, the work by Schiller, Aesthetic Education of the Men, then, then Schiller tried uh, to show the inner workings of artistic creation and perception, something that we are, of course, also very much interested as sciences. But does that also mean that beautiful images explain why we are creative? And do we need beauty in order to understand the brain? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, in, in some sense, you may think, why do I need art at all? You know, I can live without art in principle. I can survive without art on my wall. Uh, so it seems, but apparently not, apparently not. First of all, there is a very, must be very good reason, and Jan should know better than I, why did we, why 30, 60,000 years ago, we started to create art? What was the function of this art? Why should it be beautiful? Why these people in the prehistoric caves made this huge effort to go with torches down in the Lascaux cave, or I don't know, in those, those long caves and, and draw on the ceiling horses and bison? Why? Why they did it? It's, it's a need for the brain. It's a need to project. It's a need to practice the capability, which is very unique to human, to imagine something that you don't see in front of you, but you remember a bison. You don't take the bison with you into the cave, but you remember and you imagine the bison and you have this amazing capability to practice on the canvas, on the stone and reconstruct something that is there in your imagination. That's a very important tool. Art is extremely important tool to practice this capability to bring back thoughts into reality. That's one aspect. The other aspect from when I go to a museum and I enable me, myself, to go into, I don't know, Picasso or Van Gogh or, or modern ones, and I allow myself to go around, you know, allow, allow myself to just go there, it makes a lot of new connections, so to speak, in my brain, because I'm not anymore in the reality, which is very forceful. This reality is very forceful on me, you know, I need to behave, I need to, the, to say the correct things, I need to go, but in, in a museum and in front of art, piece of art, I can play, I can go, I can dream, I can make new connections, I can become creative. So for me, art is not just a coincidence, it's an essential for the brain to go forward. Thank you, Yidan. Perhaps uh, to connect to it, Yidan, um, Kassira mentioned or argued that symbolic forms 
are basic forms of understanding that are so universally valid and with which man shapes with reality. Others argue that cognition and behavior are biologically fine-tuned by natural selection and very much emphasize this point. So where mm -hmm. is your position in the spectrum? Could you please comment on this? Sure. You know, we have many, 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 many millions or billions of years of common evolution with other organisms in, in the world. And there's a tremendous amount of them in us. And, and what we have that makes us unusual is a overlayering of uh, those, uh, those capacities which were acquired that... Uh, intervals over a huge span uh, span of time. Uh, what really uh, amazes me is looking at the, the record that was left by the Neanderthals, for example. The Neanderthals are unbelievably smart. They did a lot of very difficult things and they did a lot of uh, very subtle things and they obviously understood nature in a very, uh, in a very complex manner. And yet, I'm sure they didn't live in quite the same world that we live in. And what makes us different from them is something that has to be very small and exists as a veneer over, 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 over what they possess too. So we're looking, we're looking for something, uh, when, when we're looking for human creativity and the ability to, to uh, come up with new ideas and, and, uh, and remake the world in our minds. This is something that is a, it's a new capacity, but it depends on a very, very old series of acquisitions. And we're looking for something very small. And those are always the very hard things to find. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. But now living in this time where we have this uh, dynamic development of technology and, and uh, Yidan mentioned that we can now uh, using deep brain stimulation in order to help patients with epilepsy, for example. So technology is now in the phase where we, we see direct interactions with, uh, with the brain and, and with behavior and the clinical symptoms, perhaps. So one of the questions that we received to both of you is, uh, can the technology change our brain? If the answer is yes, the change will be an improvement or deterioration. So I would like to invite you both to answer to this particular question. You're down, you yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, any, any, so the, it's a loop. We have a loop with the environment. If there is a new technology, let's say GPS, Somebody invented GPS, I put my GPS on the car and I don't need to think anymore like a taxi driver in London. I don't need to remember all the streets because the GPS does it for me. But, but before I used my hippocampus, you know, my play cells, I use a piece of brain to do all this memory about, uh, about streets and, and, and stores and so forth. Now, now there is a machine that is doing it. So certainly, absolutely, the loop between me and GPS must change my brain because now I have a piece of brain that can do something else. It's not idle. It not, doesn't go to sleep. I'm doing something else with this. Not clear yet what, but I have now a capability to take this one piece and go elsewhere. That's one direction of an answer. So of course, technology, not, it doesn't change my brain in a sense of genetics, it, it, but it does change the brain because now I have to learn this new machine and make use of it, which I didn't before. So learning is changing the brain in terms of connectivity and so on. But I'm also now using an empty, so to speak, region that used to do something. I used to climb on the trees and escape from chimpanzees. Now I don't need to do it because I have a technology, I have cars and so on. So that's, of course, there is a loop between myself, the te technology that I invent back into my brain that needs to adapt to the technology that I myself invented. That's one direction. The other direction, and I want to, to, to comment on what uh, Ian said. Now, in terms of biological, you know, are we going to become different species? You know, the evolution is relatively slow. You know, it takes 300,000 years to make a species called the Homo sapiens, but we don't need it anymore. We can manipulate our genes using technology. I can generate a new species on every day in the lab. People are generating new mouse. 
and, and other animals because we can manipulate the genome and so on. So, so that's one direction that, uh, you know, with all the ethical issues and with all the fears of, you know, becoming, so to speak, God and manipulating our gene, but we have the tools. That's, that's certainly, we have the tools. And there is no question in my mind that it will be used at some point or another, especially for diseases. The other direction is technology, because I can implant technology into my brain. I can implant sensors. I can, and there are sensors like neuropixels, you know, and Leon, and Elon Musk is developing technologies to implant the brain. So clearly we are going to become hybrid. We become te technologically hybrid with the technology, I mean, physically. We shall expand our capabilities through these sensors and machines that will be part of me. I will expand myself. I already does it. I already do it with machines. A car is an expansion. A brush for a painter is an extension. But I'm talking now about physical extension that will extend my brain. There is no question that we are going in this direction. So both genetic manipulation using technology, science, and both this technology of implanting you into your brain, into your body and so on, we are going to become different creatures or additional creatures beyond what we are today due to technology, due to our brain. Thank you, Yudan. I cannot resist uh, to, to asking back to you um, before I give the word of course to Ian. So, so are we prepared uh, to, uh, is our brain prepared in terms of hardware? And, and secondly, are we really prepared in order to interact with such a complex system as a brain is? Yeah, with all these networks, uh, are we really prepared, I mean, to, to allow such uh, technological interaction? Well, you know, we, uh, every generation really has to reinvent the wheel. Every generation has to learn how to, how to exist in the world from the ground up. And in acquiring the experience that allows you to do that, you do rewire your brain, as, as both of you know, uh, better than I do. So that in, in a sense, yes, we are changing our ways, our brains by, by introducing uh, new technologies and so on. But those technologies are equally the product of the brain. And um, we're not necessarily changing the potential of what the brain can do. Uh, human beings have been around for 200,000 years. And I, I don't think the human brain was significantly different 200,000 years ago before we started behaving symbolically than it is now. But it needed a cultural stimulus to drive it into a qualitatively different state. You know, so it has been talking about states. This is the ultimate state shift from non-symbolic to, to symbolic. And this must have happened in a very, very short time. And it certainly happened within the tenure of Homo sapiens. So I think biologically, the entity was already there 200,000 years ago. And since then, it's what we have done with that potential that has made all the difference. And we're going to continue exploring that potential um, into the indefinite future. We have no idea how far we are and ex exploring just what the brain can do. Thank you very much, Ian. Idan, I would like to come back to your talk and you have shown this beautiful image uh, of a simulation of a whole rodent brain. Uh, and the question arised, uh, what, what is the relationship between the simulation and replication of the brain? Do you consider appropriates the definition of artificial intelligence? So is it truly intelligence? Well, at this point, the simulation, just to make clear what do, we mean, what do I mean by simulation and why do I do it? You know, there was a girl uh, some years ago, I wrote an article about these blue brain simulations to this uh, journal that you mentioned for kids, these frontiers for young minds. And there was this kid who was my reviewer for this, these papers that we write for the kids, scientists write for the kids, the kids are the reviewers. So the kid, you know, the kid 11 years old, my reviewer rejected my paper because she said, you don't, you don't explain why do you simulate the brain? It already exists. So why do you simulate something that exists? You didn't explain it, so I reject your paper. This was a very beautiful rejection because my, my aim was to explain why do I simulate the brain? And if I didn't succeed to explain it to her, it means that I didn't do a good job for the rest of the kids. Mm -hmm. By the way, we have 6 million kids reading the journal today. 
six million kids, it's huge. They need to know where the world is going. So simulation here, what I, when I mean simulation, there is no artificial intelligence here. It's just a replica, a dynamical replica, like the anatomists are doing when the anatomist, like Ramon Cajal, the great anatomist, when he drew a little a neuron on the paper and then put another nerve cell near it, another nerve cell, and there is a beautiful drawing of a piece of a brain by Ramon Cajal, the anatomist, it was static. There was no movement, there was no activity. It was static, which is of course very important to understand the roadmap of the brain, but it's not enough. We want to understand the dynamics of the brain. So in the computer, I can both put the anatomy of a cell and of a group of cells, but I also can activate them mathematically so they can replicate the electrical activity and the connectivity by synapses and so on. So it's, it's, a, it's a dynamical copy of the brain. So that's what I mean by saying, I simulate the brain mathematically by replicating mathematically both the anatomy and the activity. But why do I do it? Because when you have such a big system, let's say the cortex of the mouse with 10 million neurons and about a billion synapses, connections, you cannot understand how it functions unless you really rebuild it from scratch, you know, reverse engineer it, rebuild it, and then manipulate, because now you build it, you hope it's close to reality, you build it, and then by manipulating parameters, I can understand why suddenly this brain become Parkinsonian. What are the parameters? Is it the strength of the synapses or specific cell type that doesn't function? What are the underpinning of a Parkinsonian state? We don't understand. We don't understand even one disease to the level of the mechanism. So we are hoping, we have to prove that it will work. We are hoping that by replicating a copy in the computer, manipulating parameters, the computer will become Parkinsonian. The computer will have a epileptic seizure. Not that the computer will collapse, the, 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 the network in the computer will behave, and then I will say I understand much better than I understood before. So that's my simulation. There is no intelligence there. It's not connected to a body. If you ask me if some point I will build a replica of a brain one by one, and this replica will be connected to a body, and this body will have senses, it will start to behave. Yes, this machine will be myself, because I myself am a machine. I am a machine. I have uh, neurons, I have synapses, I have body, I have uh, senses. Yes, I'm a machine. If somebody will replicate me, I already replicate myself with my daughters. So in some sense, I already did it, you know, but not through a computer. Yes, but we are not trying to do it at all. We are trying to understand diseases through simulation. Thank you, Idan. Ian. I would like to come back to you uh, co in connection to what Yidan now said, because when, when I speak with uh, colleagues from anthropology, then uh, these colleagues emphasize very much, uh, for example, the, the relevance of tool use uh, for great apes. Mm -hmm. And we see indeed that uh, chimpanzees who live uh, maybe next door to, to bonobos, have a very different way of tool use. One use it, mm -hmm. one do not use it so much. Mm -hmm. So that means that the body, of course, has a high relevance for, for what, so to say, our brain is uh, inventing in terms of behavior. So do you think that the simulation can be good enough uh, when we do mm -hmm. not, so to say, simulate at the same time the body? <laughs> Yeah, simu simulation is uh, is is a is a, is a very complex thing, and I think in the way in which uh, uh, Iran is trying to approach it is the the most creative uh, way to do it. Most simulations are simulations of a result. You know, what does what does the brain uh, what what, are, what does the brain do? So how can we get a computer to do uh, the, uh, the the same thing? And that. That is to, you know, if you look, if you look at com computers in general, they can do a lot of things, but they're always running a particular program and that program can just do one thing. And clearly there's something about, uh, <clears throat> different about the brain as a computer uh, compared to uh, a computer as a computer or indeed, or indeed vice versa. So you're simulating something that the brain does and they're trying to incorporate the structure 
is a very fascinating thing, and um, I, I, I'm sure it has plenty of, uh, uh, of uh, potential for telling us a, a, hu a huge amount. But we're still trying to simulate a product, or we're trying to simulate a, uh, a, a, a device. And um, it's integrating those two. Uh, where you find the enormous amount of difficulty. So yes, tool making is an extremely important part of the human heritage. It's our first indication that that uh, that, uh, uh, that early hominids were doing anything different from from uh, what apes do by making actual stone tools. We don't know what kind of soft tissues they may have, uh, materials they may have used to make tools. But it's our best clue that they'd moved out of the ape cognitive mold. Um, by beginning to produce tools between about three and a half and two and a half uh, um, a million years ago. And those tools got better and better and better, but stepwise. You know, there was this, this, this technological pattern of uh, non-change interspersed with very rare uh, major um, innovations until very, very recently. And so we are not looking at a process of gradual refinement in the same way that, uh, that, that, that we would do that. Yes, you know, uh, Ashley and hand axes became thinner and more sophisticated um, over the years, but then you had the new technology coming in and it's not quite the same thing that we experience by having many generations of uh, technology next to each other uh, as, we're, as, as we're doing today. So human beings are doing something rather different and they're doing something rather different, even from very, very sophisticated close relatives like the Neanderthals. I just want to add, can I add one thing about machines? I want to, to alert the audience that there is a re real revolution. We are living now in a real revolution in terms of machines, because we now introduce machines that learn. These are not static machines anymore that replicate what they uh, learned to do, uh, were aimed to do. These machines are changing as a function of environment. The machine mm -hmm. learning world, the fact that we now actually borrowed some principles from the brain, how does the brain change when you learn something new and then you borrow it to these deep, deep learning, deep machines, and, and these machines are starting to behave in a very unexpected way sometimes. Catherine mentioned this creativity of these machines. It's because they are not static. They, they now respond to the world. They are changing through this interaction with the environment, so they close this loop and they become, in some sense, individuals. These machines are becoming individuals because each machine has different experience. I think this is a huge technological advance, huge. It's really going, I think it's a huge revolution to the level of the industrial revolution. It's, it's very, very big. It's, it's, it's coming, we are going to a different world with learning machines that are born as children, so to speak, and they evolve through interactions because the software there is dynamic, it's changing. It's not the same from day to day. So if I can connect to it and also refer to a question that came from the audience earlier, uh, wouldn't it be more straightforward uh, if somebody would like to reproduce a brain than to do it uh, in an organic process? The so-called organoids uh, are being developed and, and used more and more as, as model systems for uh, for developing new therapies for brain diseases uh, in particular. But what do you think about uh, this direction of, of research and the perspectives that seem to open through the usage uh, of organoids? I think organoids is really fascinating. Just to explain that you can take, actually from each one of us, you can take a cell, mature cell, you know, re-engineer it to become stem cell, mm -hmm. And then, and then use it to build pieces of heart or pieces of liver or also pieces of brain. So there are these brain organoids that are, you know, in the dish growing and interacting. It's not complete brain still. It doesn't have the three-dimensional shape and regions and so on. You know, it's still, but, but you can use it. And it's absolutely wonderful, strong, very, very important tool to, to study diseases, for example. Uh, but still, you know, this, this, as I said, the, the anatomy of this organoid, the connectivity, the cell types, are not, it's not a real replica of the brain. And also, when this organoid grows, it becomes rather complicated on its own, 
and it's very hard to manipulate specific parameters. And again, it becomes a, a complex biological system and which you need to simulate in order to understand because in the computer, I really can manipulate each parameter and in the biology, it's more difficult to manipulate separate parameters, but it's a wonderful to new tool, this brain organoids, or a wonderful and impressive and very creative tool. So there's another question to Yidan uh, came, coming from the audience earlier, and it's also a little bit provocative. So uh, my apologies for that, but I think it's also interesting at the same time. So what are the main discoveries about the emergence of uh, consciousness that were made possible by the study of fossil remains? And this plays, of course, also a little bit uh, with a comparison that Gidan brought, that we have the structure, that we have the anatomy, but uh, as the other side of the metal, we have the function and the, the uh, we, we have the physiology and the behavior. So could you perhaps please uh, elaborate a little bit more, Ian? Uh, how these studies on, on fossils connect uh, to this notion of, um, of consciousness? Yes, I think as I tried to, to point out very briefly earlier, you have a real difficulty in making, in, in making a connection between states of consciousness, which are subjective states that we simply experience, and uh, how those might be uh, reflected in a material occupation that you might do and something that you might produce. The archeological record consists of, uh, of the durable things that people create, the things that people create that last a long time and can be found and analyzed. That's only a tiny bit of their, uh, their total behavior. And it has nothing really directly to do with the way they experience the world. And we have real huge problems in trying to imagine what, say, how a Neanderthal or a Homo erectus uh, experience the world. We don't even know how a chimpanzee, which we can observe, is subjectively responding to the world. That's something we really can't know what's going on in their head. We can look at a captive chimpanzee and see that it's really miserable and um, not uh, responding well to its environment, for, for example, and definitely processing this, this emotional state in a very complex way. But we cannot put ourselves in the place of that animal and understand exactly how how, how it's feeling. And even less can we do that in the case of extinct relatives, which um, have just left us this, uh, this material record of, 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 of what they did rather than of what they felt. And um, that is always going to be a problem. I'm not sure if we are, we are, we are prisoners of our own mindset. We're prisoners of our own way of apprehending the world and processing information about the world. And so it's really, really, really difficult for us to, 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 to abandon that mindset and put ourselves in another uh, emotion and, emotional and intellectual place. It's really tough. What do you think, Ida? I think that now that we have the ancient DNA of, let's say, Neanderthal, in principle, I can take this DNA and recreate the Neanderthal. The technology is available. If you want it, if you want more, more homos near you, we can create the Neanderthal uh -huh. and then you uh -huh. can interact with him or not. But in principle, I'm saying in principle, because we have the DNA of the Neanderthal and it was completely sequenced, we can uh -huh. reconstruct the Neanderthal. Theoretically, uh, that is true. But how would you bring it up to be a Neanderthal? We are so much what we have learned to be during our experience. And I have no idea how I would raise a, a, a genetically engineered Neanderthal to be a member of its own species. And that, and that would largely be a problem of my inability to know this basic thing about them. And, I mean, in connection to this, to both of you, this question, of course, such process, if it would be possible technologically, 
raises, of course, a lot of ethical questions. And as this is true for artificial intelligence, getting more and more um, capabilities, but for organoids as well as for this type of uh, generating organism based on the DNA. So, so what are your thoughts uh, in that respect? So what, uh, what is ethically important and, and how could we make sure um, that, that we are doing the right things? <laughs> ah, this is the most difficult question, I must say. Catherine, it's very, very difficult. I think absolutely we have to, pre to be prepared. I mean, society has to be prepared to the, for the fact that we are going to create new creatures and that artificial intelligence is going to be our escorts. And, and, and we need to decide, you know, elementary things about, you know, these automated cars that are going to do some accidents occasionally, who is to blame? Is it the engineer? Is it, is it the owner of the car? I don't know. You know, there, there are a huge amount of ethical issues coming both from this technology and from the fact that I can manipulate genetics of people. You know, somebody came to me the other day and asked me, you know, you can manipulate Parkinson. Please manipulate my brain so I will become more creative. Put an electrode in my brain. Seriously. I, I'm saying seriously. People are coming, you know, I'm not as uh, successful as my parents inject something to my brain. Do we want it? We don't want it. I think it's certainly not for the scientists to decide. Absolutely not. I think we should be part maybe, you know, as advisors and, you know, we can envision where it is going, but it should be the philosophers and artists and politicians absolutely should be the kind of committee, ethical committees, because the world is changing so fast. I mean, really so fast that we have to be prepared for it also ethically. And I, I certainly do not have global answers to this complicated issue and, and, and very frightening but also very positive because you know we shall have more free time we shall enjoy each other talking we can go to museums and create things i don't know but we have to be prepared the next generation that's why we need these frontiers for young minds these kids needs to know where the world is going it's not going to be the same world in 20 in 20 years no. not it's not going to be the same world no. we have to be very careful not to do things just because we can do them there's obviously a compelling reason for trying to help patients with Parkinson's. There's not compelling reasons necessarily to make chimeras uh, between us and other species or between other species. Um, and, and, you know, as Idan says, the ethical problems are, are huge and they're not scientific questions. They are really ethical questions and need to be debated by society as a whole. Mm. Perhaps um, as a final question to you and uh, in relationship to what we said, so in, in order to, to think about such, um, such opportunity or, or such uh, developments, wouldn't we need uh, to have uh, a more coherent theory about uh, what is consciousness, what is language, what is, so to say, um, what, what is making us um, so different and are we indeed so different from, from our relatives, uh, from uh, non-human primates? So where would you see uh, the, the state of the art, the level at which your field of research is now um, existing? So how far are we? How advanced are we at this moment? Oh. We are really uh, not very far advanced in de in, at all in, in understanding exactly what the cause and effect relationships are, say, among language and consciousness. I'm only suggesting, for example, that language was the trigger that made a pre-adapted uh, human brain function in a new way. I'm only saying it because I can't think of anything else that um, would fill that role and fill that role rapidly. We now know that really we, although our, our knowledge is increasing about the, the complexity of the lives of uh, ancient, uh, of, of ancient hominids, and we must never, never underestimate that. There was something that happened suddenly and very recently to, to create a complete change in the entire nature of the archaeological record, suggesting an entire change in the nature of the way in which humans were uh, relating 
to the world to to the world around them. So uh, we there are certain events that we have to hypothesize occurred, but the nature of those events and exactly what the mechanisms were that govern the interrelationships that are among them um, is something we we really have very little idea of at all. Catherine, Catherine, I should mention that you are one of the top person in the world to answer question related to brain and language, isn't it? You study brain and language and especially what is unique about human brain regions and so on relative, let's say, to the chimpanzee that enables us to talk. You are the anatomist of language in many ways. Yes, I'm indeed very much interested in language and uh, I'm, I'm convinced that it is not so much the word as a word, so to say, that this is the center, but it's really the, the rules that connect the different worlds with each other. And um, I see language um, at the same level, um, if you like, like, like arts also. It's another way to express, to communicate more directly. Um, and uh, when we better understand language, uh, I'm, I'm convinced that we also can better understand uh, the brain. And yeah, well, but last word to you, Yedan, and uh, then I think we, we should come to an end also of this discussion, but I would like you as a speaker, this opportunity also to comment like Ian commented. No, I just want to summarize that I really enjoy this kind of interactive meetings. I think Prada did the wonderful thing. It's very, very optimistic at these difficult times for all of us to be close at home, you know, not interact usually with people which is part of my creativity. If you ask me, when do I create mostly? It's when I interact with people, my students. When we raise issues and they disagree with me and we, we discuss, I miss it a lot. I really, really miss it a lot. So this is in some sense, something very optimistic, this aspect. Also the fact that Europe, I'm very much in heaven uh, because the Europe announced this, uh, what, they, what they call the, 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 the new Bauhaus project. Uh, you know, Bauhaus was again, the Bauhaus uh, uh, was a project really that actually connects, you know, architecture. Here in Tel Aviv, we have a lot of Bauhaus buildings, but they thought about architecture and art connected to environment. And I'm very proud of Europe. Actually, I'm, I want to be part of this in many, in many ways, that Europe announced the second Bauhaus project, because they understand that something about architecture and environment, building, and green building and energy and science go together. So for me, this is very special times, both sad because of the corona, but also optimistic because there are new things happening due to the corona. So I'll, that's my summary of the state of art today, both sad and, and optimistic. Thank you very much. So we, we touched together a lot of questions and some of them really fundamental and I'm also sure that many of them are quite controversial. But on the other hand, I think this is science. So this is precisely what, what makes science uh, also true, that we can discuss very openly, very controversially, uh, and try to find the right ways, the right solution. And uh, I'm really happy to see that this workshop today, uh, organized uh, by uh, Prada Foundation, uh, did this contribution. And it was exciting to see that this workshop was very lively and we have a lot of uh, virtual conferences uh, all over uh, the time and um, for me it was a particular pleasure to us to discuss with you both guys. Thank you very much Ian, thank you very much Didan for this uh, discussion. Thank you very much for uh, Nación Prada and at the end um, I would like to hand over uh, back to Professor Comey for the final words and Thank you, the audience, for your questions. Sorry that we did not answer to everything, but I hope that we have uh, contributed a lot to answering your questions. Thank you. So let me say that it was a fantastic discussion, really. And I want to join Catherine just to thank so much Jan and Idan for really this fantastic evening. And also, I think that we had the big advantage to have with us as a moderator, someone who was so deeply in all what has been discussed that was really able to make everything really perfect. 
And we heard that there is a lot of uh, knowledge that we have uh, acquired, in particular in the recent years, but there is still a lot of unknown. And please don't, don't miss the discussion tomorrow, the last discussion, because this is exactly on the topic of the still open questions. And unfortunately, there are so many still open questions. And uh, there will be two different perspectives in this type of last session. We will have a philosopher, Michele Di Francesco from Pavia. And he will uh, talk about 50 years of consciousness, a philosophical history. At the same time, we will have uh, one of the most important neuroscientists, Giulio Tononi from uh, Madison in Wisconsin, uh, one of the persons who have dedicated their life to uh, consciousness and brain. So consciousness and our place in nature will be the topic. And Viviana Kazam, a very famous neurojournalist, I have to use this definition, will, be, will moderate the session. And at the end, the philosopher Massimo Cacciari and myself, we will conclude. So I hope that you enjoyed, as I did, this fantastic discussion and be back tomorrow evening. All the best to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shalom. Bye. Thank you, oh, thank you Prada. Thank you, Prada.